it gives a proportional uh, uh, idea. But it also includes, what I like about this picture is that it includes also the last two categories at the bottom, non-religious and atheist, uh, that together represent only about 14% of the world's population. Uh, and yet, in terms of the, li the link of, the, of those particular worldviews to the ways in which the West has developed, and especially the scientific discourse, uh, sometimes that 14% has more weight internationally than some of the other worldviews. Um, but we can come back on this later if need be. Um, let me now go back historically, therefore, to the period of, of the Prophet Muhammad when the concept of the Ummah was developed, uh, predominantly in, with the constitution uh, or, or the Wathiq uh, Medina, the constitution or the covenant of Medina, which was a social contract uh, whereby one community was created of diverse tribes living under the sovereignty of God. And so, to me, it is an example, a brilliant example of, of pluralism in action. The concept may not have been there at that time, but the practice was there. Um, and it brought together and it ended intertribal conflicts, and it brought together a variety of original groups to the then called city of Yathrib, which soon thereafter became the city of Al-Medina. Um, and the list is here, as well as, of course, the new immigrant uh, group, uh, the Muhajirun, uh, the Muslims from Mecca, as such. And why is it a reflection of pluralism? Because it is an inclusive social contract for everybody that lived there. So it was a, a contract that allowed for some unity uh, uh, of the community, recognizing diversity of some identities. Uh, in terms of ethnicity, of tribe, and even to some degree religious uh, uh, worldviews. So that's why I think that we can look at the example of that constitution as a, a form of integrated pluralism, uh, a unity in diversity. Our arrangement is that when I finish one slide, there's translation. Ashara ila rasm al bayani al zahir amamakum wa 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 rasm bayani عدة عام 2005 حول الأديان في العالم أتباع الأديان وذكر نسبة المسلمين والنصارى وأن وأشار إلى الذين يعتقدون الذين لا يعتقدون بأي دين أو يرفضون الأديان والذين والملحدين فيقول أن نسبة هؤلاء بلغت 14% ولكن يقول من يعني غرائب هذا الزمن أن ال 14% هؤلاء قد يكون لهم تأثير أكثر من غيرهم وسيعود إلى هذا الموضوع فيما بعد كما أشار إلى ظهور مفهوم الأمة في صحيفة الصحيفة أو الكتاب الذي كتبه الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم بين أطراف سكان المدينة من مهاجرين وأنصار ومن كان على غير الإسلام و ولم يشر إلى أيضا اليهود ويقال أن هذه الصحيفة أنهت الصراعات بين الفرق المختلفة وهي عقد سمح بوجود وحدة بين سكان المدينة وكذلك من الناحية الدينية وهو مثال للتعددية والوحدة والتنوع and so, of course, some of you may already know that the aims of the Constitution of Medina included several factors. I'm going to list them there quickly. Uh, and the reason is because they actually resonate with some of the needs that we find in our societies today as well. So security, religious freedoms, the notion uh, that is not yet uh, on a broader level, but the creation in Medina of a haram or a sacred place, which I would argue would be necessary to create in other places also, uh, for example, I can see the, 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 the thought of creating in the old city of Jerusalem the concept of haram uh, as a sacred uh, place without any kind of violence and, and, a, and a zone of peace so that all worshippers can pray in their sacred sites within the old city walls. Um, and so that's an idea which I think we can translate and, and, and bring forth as part of the heritage of Islam to, uh, uh, that could serve also the Muslims and non-Muslims in the old city of Jerusalem. Um, there is notions of security of women already at that time. There was notion of stable relations, tribal relations within the diversity of tribal differences at that time. 
There was notion of a tax system for supporting the community in times of conflict. Of course, notions which uh, are just further developed today. But one can actually see by actually looking at all of the content of this particular uh, 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 covenant that uh, in many ways it was forward-looking, but also that these are some of the elements uh, in a social contract, whether it happens at, the, at a small scale as the city of Medina or whether it happens at a national level or whether it happens internationally. ذكرنا من أهداف صحيفة المدينة وأنها ترتبط بما نحتاجه اليوم وهناك عدة نقاط في هذه الصحيفة منها الأمن والطمأنينة والعلاقات بين مختلف السكان تحديد حدود الحرم وأشار إلى أن هذه قضية يعني جميلة لو طبقت في عصر الحاضر أو تطبق حتى في منطقة في القدس وأن هذه منطقة الحرم منطقة أمن وسلام منطقة يمنع فيها الصيد يمنع فيها القتل يمنع فيها أشياء كثيرة يمكن أن نستفيد منها في هذا الزمن وذكر أن هذه الوثيقة أو هذه الصحيفة أشارت إلى أمن النساء والعلاقات بين القبائل ومسألة الدفاع عن المدينة وهي وإن كانت يعني صحيفة أو دستور أو وثيقة لمدينة واحدة صغيرة لكن يمكن تطبيقها على مستوى أوسع من ذلك بكثير. So when we think about pluralism or ideas of pluralism then and now, um, even though the concept itself of تعدديه in Arabic is recent, the practice in many ways is old. And so we look at first the concept of the Ummah, which was all inclusive in the first years in Medina. But we can also look at the concept of the good governance, which was at the center of the letter which the fourth caliph, uh, Khalif Ali bin Abi Talib, uh, wrote, when he wrote to Malik al-Ashtar, uh, who had just been nominated to become the governor of Egypt in, in what is 656 in our, uh, the Common Era, and the way in which that uh, particular letter uh, provides a long series of recommendation on what good governance means uh, in those days. And it's fascinating to see that the, uh, the United Nations report on, this, uh, on the state of development in the Arab world in 2002 used six passages from that particular letter. Uh, uh, and I think it again creates a sense that notions of good governance uh, and the theory in this case of good governance uh, was in fact very much part of, of one uh, very important uh, religious leader in the early history of Islam. And all of these concepts of hukuma and wilaya and amr and mulk and etc. Were, were concepts, rich concepts around governance uh, that uh, today uh, are being re-examined uh, in order to think about an Islamic political philosophy that can be adapted for the needs of uh, the day. The um, example, other examples in Islamic history, very briefly, of course, are uh, the, Andalus, uh, the Umayyad period in Andal Andalusia, um, especially the reigns of the three Abdul Rahman. One can look also at the early Abbasid period and uh, the uh, Ottomans. I have another one. Sorry. Of the early Ottomans, uh, or some of the Ottoman period. And now, again, one can trace a lineage of some of those pluralist approaches into the Imam message, the open letter. But even I, were, are, I would argue in the recent efforts here in Saudi Arabia of promoting a national dialogue uh, and trying sort of to develop, a, 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 in a way, a practice uh, of uh, some dimensions of pluralist uh, approach, uh, of reaching out to a variety of area, all the different areas within the kingdom, as well as uh, uh, different sectors of society and addressing different issues over the years. And so I think that these are examples of, of pluralist practice uh, of a different kinds, uh, but that does say again that this notion has already some dimension of existence within Islamic history then and now. بعد الحديث عن صحيفة المدينة ذكر أن علي بن أبي طالب رضي الله عنه أرسل رسالة إلى مالك بن الأشتر واليه على مصر والتي لم تصل أو قتل حامل الرسالة ولكن فيها توصيات رائعة للحكم الرشيد والأمم المتحدة في تقريرها عن التنمية البشرية والتنمية الإنسانية للعالم العربي استخدمت ست نقاط من تلك الرسالة والرسالة تحمل مفاهيم كثيرة عن الحكومة والولاية والملك 
ومفاهيم ثرية ويتم العودة إليها اليوم كما أشار إلى الحكم الأموي في